Good evening. Before I speak, I want to say something. Uh, I'm not apologizing for it. I'm just telling you because it's what the text does and I'm copying the text. If you think every time I get up here that I'm just a mean, depressed guy who's always in a sore attitude and I'm obviously having I don't know what kind of problems at home because I'm always preaching down on everybody's toes, I just want you to know I'm not a depressed guy and that I'm a happy person. We have a happy home. But what I'm doing is I'm working through the book of James. And James will go, and what he's doing is he's writing to a specific people and he's explaining the situation that he's in uh, and the situation that they're in and he's trying to give advice on their situation. So because he knows them, if he gets upset with them, it'll come off a little harsh sometimes. Now if you sit down and you read the book of James, you might read for half an hour to an hour. But if you sit down and you read this, you get a sermon off of this that's a half an hour every single time you listen to it, what it sounds like is me blowing up every time you hear me talk. <laughs> I'm not apologizing for it. What I'm saying is, don't think I'm a depressed guy, and don't think I'm always angry or that I can't preach a happy sermon. I can. Unfortunately, tonight, James ain't doing that. <laughs> and I'm copying his model. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Jeremiah Stepik had been formally offered the job at this new congregation. And it had been months and months ago that the congregation had met him, so he knew he had a little time to grow out his facial hair real, real long and to grow out his, his beard and his hair. And he grew those things out, and he knew on his first day of the job he wanted to challenge his new congregation. So he went out and he mowed the grass and he got some dirty clothes and he, he didn't wear any shoes and he went to the front lawn of the new congregation and wore a trench coat over the top of him. And he waited to see the reaction that this new congregation might have of him. He said, surely somebody will come up to me, but he waited. And nobody ever did. They'd walk by. And there's no telling what in the world they might have been thinking. Maybe they were thinking, hopefully he doesn't ask me if I can help him. Uh, we've got a few cops that go to church with us. Maybe they can kind of shoo him off, right? But that isn't what happened. Instead, that preacher walked into the church and he sat in the back row, right between two families. And when he sat down and he had that smell and he had that look, those two families shot one to one side and one to the other side and left him alone alone. And his communion went around. He sang alone. And he communed alone. And he, he worshipped alone. And then it was time for the sermon. He had already had a talk, and with the, talk with the elders. They would announce that he was going to preach his first sermon. So he gets, or he doesn't get up. The preachers announce, they say, Jeremiah's here for his first week on the job. Everybody get ready for Jeremiah, our new preacher, his, his first sermon. So he sits in that back row, and everybody starts clapping. <laughs> And it gets slower and awkward, and they all look back. And Jeremiah stands up, that poor man. He shuffles to the middle row, and he gets there, and he walks to the front. And he, he quotes from Matthew. He says, when I, was, when I was poor, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. And it all culminated to, when you didn't do these to the least of these, you didn't do it for me either. And instead of offering invitation, instead of doing anything else, he dismissed the church and he walked out. His first week on the job, Jeremiah. What a powerful story. I wished I had thought to do it my first week at Valley View. I wished I had grown out, looked like a hippie my first day on the job and preached and scolded all of you for being as close-minded as you are. But I didn't think of it. This man thought of it. There's a website, it's called Snoops, and you'll see sometimes they'll post on Facebook. They look at all of these different Facebook articles and they try to figure out which ones are true and which ones are not. And they've done one on Jeremiah Stepik and they haven't found him. They said lots of preachers, I guess like this one, tell this story, but we haven't found Jeremiah Stepik. 
So I don't know if this story is true or not, but I think there's a reason that if you've heard this story before, it's probably because of, of two things. One, a preacher has preached it before and you have heard it. Or two, you have seen it shared on the internet 100 billion million times. It's been there. You've probably heard this story before. I think there's a reason it's been shared that many times. It pulls at the heartstrings of Christians all over the nation. And I think deep down it does that because, because we know that if it happened to us today, that we might be guilty of it too. You may have thought about it as I was saying it. How would you react if the same thing happened to you? Would, would you have invited him in? Would you have sat next to him at communion and, and wanted to pass your tray along or, or maybe talked with him about maybe if he were a Christian? Would, would you have done those things? But I'm, I'm here to say that maybe we wouldn't. Maybe we wouldn't have done those things. And that's the reason it's been shared a million times. I don't know if this is a true story, but I do know that whatever preacher started this story copied somebody else's model. James does the same thing in his book. So go ahead and turn there with me. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 is what we're going to be reading. Before we read it, I want you to pay attention to a few things as we get into the text. The very first verse, James is going to tell the congregation that they, should, that they had better not have a faith in Jesus Christ and play favorites. It doesn't work that way. If you're going to be a Christian, you don't play favorites. But instead of just saying, if you're going to be a Christian, don't play favorites and making a stern command, he just says, uh, he, he doesn't leave it there. He tells this great big story. He tells a very specific situation that he has seen in the church that he's writing to. So James chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. He could have left it there, but he keeps talking. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or you sit down at my feet, we ain't got enough pews for you, buddy. Have you not then made distinctions? Have you not then been prejudiced among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? In James's text, he could have left it as a blunt command. Do not show favoritism, but he doesn't. He tells a story. He wants them to see that this has been happening. Long before Jeremiah Stepik started his illustration with this church, James had already showed the congregation the problem that their sin of favoritism was causing. And as he reads, and he knows it's going to be read aloud to them. It isn't like John or James carried the letter himself. He gave it to a man who took that letter and read it to this congregation. And he knows it's going to be read. And if you pay attention, you can kind of see the people squirm in their seats. I want you to read with me one more time. We're going to read verse 1 and we're going to skip down to verse 4. Chapter 2. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Verse 4. Have you not then made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? They said, boy, he sure is preaching to me today. What a hard message. What a difficult thing to, to read. And as he reads this to the church, remember, they are in church. There are some people there who are sitting in pews. And there are also poor people there who are sitting on the floor. And as he reads it, the poor people on the floor begin to look up at those who are in the pews. And those who are in the pews look anywhere but down at the people who are on the floor. They'll look to the ceiling. They'll look to the walls. They'll look at the widow. But you better believe they're not looking at those who are in the floor. It was tense. Who do you say think sat on the floor next week in church? I bet it wasn't the rich man if they came back to church at all. Church, who have we been sitting on the ground below our smelly feet? 
You may look around and say, well, we've got a thousand seat pews, Jonathan. Look at all the seats that are available. We could fit a million men in this room. And to say that we've got more men than we have seats, uh, you would be right in saying that. But just because we've got pews for a thousand men doesn't mean that we haven't been exalting those who we think are deserving. And it doesn't mean that we haven't been pushing down those who we think aren't deserving of the gospel. James has already talked about in chapter 1 the poor Christian and the rich Christian. He's going to do it again in chapter 5 and he does it right here. If James pushes it, I'm going to preach it three times just like James is. For whatever reason, James's church struggled with favoritism more than just about anything else. And I say that to say that the church hasn't changed much in 2,000 years. I want you to look with me at verse 1 again, and we're going to read this text. Chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. This word partiality has its root in the Greek word press upon. I said I'd never preach and use the Greek. I think it's important that you see it here. Press upon. Uh, what they thought of and what that word means in its root is face. When they heard the word partiality, they thought of the face. They thought they were judging somebody based upon what they saw in them. They were essentially doing this. Favoritism equals this. Judging someone based on face value. Shallow, surface level value. There's one judge that we see in Scripture that judges for the right things. And the reason he judges is something we should model our own judging after. His name is Christ. There were things that he would judge. He wouldn't base his judgments upon the shallow things that we based upon, what based them upon. Instead, he reaches out to those who those who are judging the, the Pharisees were, were making fun of and, and even trying to throw in jail and in prison. He called those people to himself. Those are the ones he thought were valuable. Who was accepted by Christ and who was best used for his kingdom? It wasn't the wealthy. It wasn't the religious elite. It wasn't Christ's faith alone. It wasn't his race alone. It wasn't his family alone. It wasn't popularity. It wasn't those of influence. And it wasn't the healthy that Christ preferred for service to his kingdom. Instead, and strangely enough, who Christ attracted to his kingdom were those that were rejected by society. And Christ still draws those people to himself. Even if sometimes him drawing them to himself is rejected by those who call themselves followers of him. And as I say that, I want you to think, who are you a disciple of? Are you a disciple of Christ? Or are you a modern follower of a Pharisee? I don't know what it looks like for you. What, are you, what we are doing is essentially this, and if you hear nothing else, hear this. We are judging people based upon the value that we see in them rather than what makes them special to Christ. And it's not just James's audience, church. Like I said earlier, the church hadn't changed much in 2,000 years. We've been judging people based upon their faces and found them worthy of our feet. We've been doing it for 2,000 years. I don't know what it looks like for you, but I've got an idea. Let's say that your son is in middle school. And he tells you, I wish more than anything my friend from school can come home with me after church on Wednesday night. So you say, okay, bring your friend, and you invite them along. You pick them up after school. They come over to your house. They spend the whole day with your son. They eat dinner with him, and then after dinner, you drive to church. And when you get there, that boy is respectful. He listens the way he's supposed to. He even prays with your son and listens attentively to the service. He's turning in his Bible, and everything goes great, and then you drive drive him home. You get in your car and you say, I don't have my GPS. You lead me on the way to go. And he starts pointing in these directions. And soon that concrete path turns to dirt, gravel, a whole network of roads you didn't even know were there, a whole different people that you haven't been seeing. 
And soon the potholes become so deep that you can't even drive over them. You've got to drive around them because if you didn't, you would mess up the undercarriage of your car. And as you drive, you begin to look to your right and your left and the houses are beginning to get rougher and rougher. And you can tell this is a really impoverished area. And you drive towards the boy's house and he tells you about his dad. My dad collects cars. He loves to, to collect cars. And if you look, you can see them. But as you look... You can't see the cars because the grass is as high up as your hip. You can't see the cars for the grass. You look over at that boy and you say, Boy, it looks like your family's excited to see you. And he says, Why? It's because your whole family's on the front porch waiting for you. And he says, They're always on the front porch. We don't go in till the sun goes down because we don't have air conditioner like they have in school and we never have. And you look through that shotgun house all the way to the other side. There is no front door. There is no back door. And you wonder, how in the world do so many people fit into such a small house? How in the world do so many people live there? And as he leaves, you look back at your son and you say, Son, don't invite that boy back. And he'll look at you and he'll say, why? Why can't I invite him back? And you might use scripture to defend yourself. Bad company corrupts good character, son. Don't hang out with that boy. As if poverty is a symptom of sin and it's not. And as if that boy can help his situation and he can't. What if he invites you back to church next week? I'm not going to let that happen. Heaven forbid my son be around those people. And when we do that kind of thing, we're teaching our children three lessons. Number one, we only associate with people who look like us. Number two, we can twist scripture to say anything that we want it to say in the moment. And number three, those in poverty are not worthy of the gospel. Who have we been sitting at the floor below our smelly feet? Who's looking up at us begging for equality and asking for the chance to hear the gospel but is being rejected because we've judged them based upon face value rather than the value that they've been given through Jesus Christ. And we say, well, Jonathan, your preacher's getting awful preachy. Favoritism can't be that big of a deal. Partiality isn't that big of a deal. In church, I'm not preaching anything James didn't preach before me. I want you to look at the text. James chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Turn with me there. But if you show partiality, if you judge people based on face value, you are committing a sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has been accountable for all of it. For he who says do not commit adultery also says do not murder. But if you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have also become a transgressor of the law. Do you see what he's saying? He's anticipating these Christians replying Lying to them that there's no way that, that adultery is equal to murder. And there's no way that, that there's, it's possible that partiality can be as bad as, as killing somebody. And James's reply is, hold on a minute, it totally is. It's just as wrong. And I would feel blasphemous saying it if James hadn't said it first. It's a big, big deal. And it sounds harsh. And they don't have the same consequences. It's not as if you go to jail for playing favorites. It doesn't work that way. You go to jail for murder. But the overall consequence of being removed from God in your relationship with Him and growing in a way that doesn't conform to His image, that's the same consequence. Think about it. What are you saying when you play favorites? You are judging the worth of an individual in the eyes of God because you aren't affording the poor the same opportunity to hear the gospel as a wealthy man. Yeah, it is totally a deadly sin. It is bad. Bad as murder. But when was the last time that you got on your hands and knees and you begged for mercy because you played favorites? And I don't know for me, and I'm the preacher, I can count on one hand how many times that I've done that and it was in preparation for this sermon because I didn't think it was a big deal either. But it is a big deal. Churches across the world are dying because of this sin. Black churches and white churches are meeting on opposite ends of town and will shrink and die rather than join together in the face of their death because of favoritism 
baptism that each has for his own race. And just so you know, Christ didn't establish a black church and a white church or this church or that church or in any church that wasn't the one true church. He established his church and we are the church of Christ. We're established on the idea and the, the principle. It, what we're striving for is to be the New Testament church. We want to be what's in this book. But even we have forgotten the worth of a poor man. We've forgotten that the poor are rich in spirit. Partiality is murder because it's killing the Lord's church. Before we talk about a solution, and James gives us one, I want us to, to pray together. And as I pray, if you feel convicted that you, you've been doing this and you didn't realize how big a deal it was, but that you want forgiveness of it, then pray for forgiveness with me because I need it. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you've given us your mercy and your grace and that you saved us through baptism and that you're continually cleansing us of our sins. And sometimes we mess up so big and we don't even realize the mess up that we've caused. But I ask that you please overabundantly overfill us with mercy because we've missed it. And as we become aware of the sin that we're in, that you help us correct it. Empower us with your spirit and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. James offers us hope. James spent 11 verses spelling out the problem. He spends two on solution. I guess you can see how short this little next part is going to be. When you see that this struggle is happening, you'll see it bubble up all over the place. The first part of realizing that you've got a problem with favoritism is admitting that you have a problem with favoritism. But it's hard to when you don't even see it was there in the first place. Well, now, hopefully, you've seen it. I'll give you some examples. Partiality in sex is sexism. Partiality in age is ageism. Partiality in race is racism. Where have you been partial? See it in your life and eliminate it. And you'll see that when you realize that you've got this problem, it'll bubble up all over the place. Places you weren't even expecting. You'll see it this week. You'll see, man, I was really, I was playing favorites right there. It's going to happen this week. Pay attention to that voice in your head. That's one of the things that this word does. It gives you an awareness of the places that you've been messing up in your life. And it gives you the tools so that you can overcome them. Warren Wiersbe says, one of the tests of the reality of our faith. And you want to know if your faith is real. One of the tests of the reality of our faith is how we treat other people. Can we pass the test? Now that we've seen this problem, what is our driving force? In verses 12 and 13, he gives us the reason we do what we do. He tells us what is this driving force? What, what is the solution? What's causing it to happen? Do you know the parable? And I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read the text. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about that parable. The parable of the man who doesn't forgive his servant who is who he has forgiven, right? Okay, let me explain it. I'm bad, I just can't put it down. There's a king, a wealthy king, and he brings in this servant who owes him a gazillion billion bazillion dollars. There's a reason it sounds so high. It's because it's so high, I can't even say all the numbers involved with it. It's not a real number. Just he is so deep in debt that there is no way he's going to get out of it. And he asked for forgiveness. And he says, please, I've got, I've got a wife and kids. Don't, don't put me in prison. And he says, okay, I'll show you mercy. Forgiven. Everything's gone. It's all been forgiven. And then that servant, after he is forgiven, leaves. And this boy comes up to him and he's got a quarter that he owes him. And he says, hey, man, I want to go buy some bubble gum. Give me my quarter back. And he says, I don't have the quarter. But I've got a wife and kids. Please don't throw me in jail. And then the unforgiving servant says, no, you're going in jail for the rest of your life because you didn't give me back that quarter. And the king finds out and he says, I forgave you all a gazillion million dollars. You can't hold this man responsible for a quarter. It doesn't work that way. Those who have been given mercy have an obligation to extend mercy. Now keep that story in the back of your mind. And hold on to it and think about your baptism, the day of your baptism. 
the day you were baptized, what was rolling through your mind? I was nine years old. Harold Kelly, my preacher, he, he sat down with me and he said, Jonathan, they don't know if you know why you're getting baptized, but let's talk through some things. So he wrote out the Ten Commandments for me. And by one, 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 I, I'd made a whole lot of mistakes. I guess we skipped over adultery. Nine-year-old Jonathan hadn't done that. But I, I had done a whole lot on that list. I was convinced. I was convicted. I, I had messed up. I had made a mistake, and I needed to have forgiveness of that. I needed mercy, and I need grace. And for you, it was the same way. Maybe you were older, and you realized this mound of, of sin that I have accrued over my life, there's no way. There's no way I'm deserving of forgiveness. And yet, out of no ability of your own, God extended his mercy and grace to you. And I want you to take these two ideas, this, this parable, this parable of this unforgiving servant and the day of your baptism. And I want you to think about those two things tonight when you drive home and you see a man with a sign and it says, anything will help, God bless, thank you, on a street corner. And I know it's there because I see it every day on my way home on the corner of Johnson and Maine. There is a man or a woman who's standing there. I think they may even rotate days. They hold that sign and they ask for help. And when I drive up to the sign, you know what I do? I've been trained well. I don't look at them. I look anywhere other than at them. I look at the sign. I look at the people next to me. I play on my phone. I pick my nose. I don't know, but I do not look at that person, right? Because maybe if I don't look at them, they won't look at me and I won't feel like such a bad Christian. And you ignore them. And as a matter of fact, you turn around and you tell your kids, you say, hey, don't look. Lock your door. Now you could do that and you could teach your child that or you could do what a lot of people here do. It's easy to just look over them and not show mercy to those. And make no mistake, when you do that to somebody, you have judged every sin that they've ever committed. You think, well, there's a reason they're sinning on the street corner. They have obviously made a lot of mistakes in life or they would be where I am. They're driving this truck on my way home. You've judged. They're panhandling, obviously. And sometimes it really is that. Now you could do that. You could refuse to show mercy or you could do something harder than that. There's something that a lot of the members here, a few of the members here do. They go to the North Point Church and they hand out bags to people who are in need once a month. It's easy to not show mercy. It's harder to go into the community where people are struggling and give them bags to help. Engage with their lives. Figure out about them. And the people who do that are extending mercy. Rather than driving on past that street corner and locking their door and telling their kid not to look, they say, hey, this weekend we're going to a place where we're going to interact with the people who need help. We're finding real ways that we can serve God in our community and we're going to extend mercy to people. Both of these Christians are teaching their children messages. Which children or which message do you want to be giving your children? I'll tell you another way you can do it. Gary James goes to the prison. He goes to jail once a month. He's proud of it. I go to jail. That's what he says. Go with Gary James to jail and minister to those people. Because if you do, you're going to extend mercy to somebody who never would have ever been extended mercy ever anywhere in his life ever. You're going to extend that man mercy. And it's a worthy thing. That is what Scripture tells us to do. I want you to look back over that final verse. I've lost it in my notes, but this is the general gist. Go down to verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to those who have been shown no mercy. For those who has shown no mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment. The resounding answer of this text is, the reason, and your driving force is, why you should do it and why you will do it is because you've been given mercy. That's why we don't play favorites and that's why we choose to extend it to people in our community. Have you been doing it? By way of invitation, I want to say that if you look in your life, and you'll probably notice, and I know I'm guilty of it too, that you, you fall short of extending mercy to people, and you have a problem with, with favoritism. I think that is a struggle for every single person. I think that's why it's brought up three times in the book of James. 
then why don't you let us pray for you about it? If, if you want to see with the eyes of Christ so that, you, that you don't play favorites and that you aren't uh, partial to race or you aren't partial to age, there is something really powerful that happens to you in that water. So the Holy Spirit, He gives you the ability to see with different eyes and you've got to have those different eyes to be able to do it. Then why not get baptized? Why don't you do those things as we stand and as we sing? Lord, make us instruments of your peace.